Hi, I'm Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis. And today we're going to have a little video about measurement, ac uncertainty, accuracy, and precision. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that you need to do is make sure you've done the reading assignment before you watch this video. The assignment is from your OpenStax textbook. It is section 1.5, measurement uncertainty, accuracy, and precision. Here's a link, and a link is also in the description of the YouTube video as well. If you have not read that part of the section, please stop the video, read that, and then come back to the video. So one of the key things that this chapter is trying to illustrate for you and uh, drive home is this idea of significant figures. Um, when we take measurements, we are not always able to get an exact number. Um, so for example, an exact number is something like counting the number of apples in a bag. You know that if you have four apples in that bag, you exactly have four apples in that bag. However, when we take measurements in the lab, we're usually measuring quantities of things such as like a liquid that you're seeing here on the screen. So this piece of glassware is called a graduated cylinder and it's got uh, markings on it. And those markings help us determine the amount of volume of the liquid that is in said graduated cylinder. So if you can see here, there's this section that gets magnified and you can tell that the meniscus, this uh, slightly curved part of the fluid, um, that is pointing down because it's water and it's in a glass cylinder and there's this stuff called intermolecular forces that we'll talk about later. Um, this downward curvature here, um, you are responsible in chemistry to determine exactly what that volume will be. And by exactly, that's where significant figures come into play. You have to use your eyes and determine what you are going to deem that volume to be. Now, first off, whenever we do a measurement like this, we always measure from the bottom or the top. If the meniscus is going the other way, we measure from the bottom or the top of the meniscus. Here, because the meniscus is going down, we're gonna measure from the bottom of it. So right where the cursor is here on the screen, we're gonna measure from the bottom. Now, if you're looking, and you can see here in this uh, even more magnified area, the meniscus is in between the two graduations, the two marks on the piece of glassware. So the meniscus isn't sitting squarely on one of those marks. This is where we have to decide what that number shall be. Um, so the big mark that we're able to see in the uh, graduated cylinder is it looks like at every tick, it goes up by one milliliter. So we know we've reached the 20 milliliter mark, we are past the 21 milliliter mark, and we're some portion of the way up to the 22 millimeter mark. We have to guess as best as we can with our eyes by reading the meniscus what value exists right here. This would be our first uncertain digit, okay? Um, we have to say, we know it's got 20, we know it's got 21, and it looks to me kind of like this meniscus is halfway between 21 and 22, so I'm going to call this 21.5. That zero, or that 0 0.5 there at the end is my last significant figure. It is where I am saying, yeah, I can be relatively certain based off of my judgment call that that's the halfway mark between the 21 and the 22. So I'm going to say that the water is 21.5. Now you may be looking at it and you may say, oh, it's a little bit above the halfway mark. I'm going to call it 21.6. Cool. That 0. 0.6, that is our first uncertain digit. And we're saying it's uncertain because we don't have any kinds of markings or graduations here to guide us. So it's our first uncertain digit, making it our last significant figure. So th this is a number that we know we can't tell anything in the hundredths place. We can tell the tenths, but we can't tell to the hundredths. 
And by telling to the tenths, I'm meaning we can make what that uh, make that good quality educated guess is. So there are some rules whenever we uh, are going to present numbers to uh, fellow people in the scientific community. Um, and these rules are ways for us to tell other people how precise a measurement is. So that precision is going to come into play and it's going to say, okay, like how, like to what degree do we know what the actual value is? Um, so let's go briefly over the rules for significant figures. This is an additional rule set to what you find in the uh, chapter. So both of these work. The chapter reading has a rule set that totally works. This is just another way of ex explaining the information. So when we're counting up a significant figure in a number, any non-zero integer is always going to be a significant figure. It's always going to count. So your 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 always count as significant figures. Your zeros are where things get a little bit more complicated. So the first classification of zero we have here is called a leading zero. So the zero and the ones, the tenths, the hundredths, the thousandths, all of those are basically placeholder zeros. So we know that we don't have anything of, that has been measured in any of those places. There's no quantity of anything there. Um, it's, it's a placeholder. It's a leading zero. It's a zero in front of a one, which is a non-integer value or a non-zero integer value. This number, even though it's got one, two, three, four, five numbers in it, it only has one significant figure. And that one significant figure is the one itself. Now, on the other hand, we have captive zeros. And captive zeros are always going to count as being significant digits or significant figure, towards our significant figures. So, 10,003. The one in the 10... 10,000s place is definite, definitely significant. The three is definitely significant. These zeros in between, well, now we do know that there is something there. Yeah, you could say, well, they're kind of holding a place too. Yeah, but we know we have zero quantity in the thousands, zero quantity in the um, hundreds and in the tens place. And we know we have a significant figure here in the 10 thousandths place. And we know we have something out here in the ones place. So we, this is a fairly precise measurement here. Um, because we know exact quantities here, they're place holding, but they're telling us there's no measurement there. We're gonna say that this has five sig figs. Every single one of these digits counts as a sig fig. Trailing zeros. Okay, gets a little bit uh, granular in our reasoning here. So let's take a num let's take the number 300. Um, 300 written out this way, 300 zero, zero, is only going to have one significant figure. The zeros behind the three are going to be trailing zeros. Um, we don't, unlike the example that we had previously, where we had the three in the ones place, now we don't have anything in the ones place. In fact, the last measurement that we tr truly know that we have is this three right here at the beginning in the hundreds place. So we only have one significant figure. We have not written this number in a way that a reader can be certain whether there is anything in the tens or the ones place. There's, we can't, for writing it this way, we can't, we're not describing it accurately. Now let's take, for example, the uh, 3.00. Now, obviously this is a different number than 300, but we've got this three that is significant. Now we're taking the time and we're saying we have measured in the tenths and the hundredths place and there's nothing there. By writing it out this way, by putting those zeros there beyond an integer value, a non-zero energy value, we're saying we have measured 
out to this level and that there's nothing there. So these trailing zeros, because they are to the right of a decimal, where we're saying we've measured it, there's nothing there, all three of these value numbers are significant. So this has three significant figures. Now let's go back to the 300 example. Let's say that we wanted to say, hey, we counted up exactly 300. We know that there are 300 of the thing. A better way to present that to your audience to let them know that there is 300 and that it should have three sig figs is to use scientific notation. And scientific notation is going to involve moving the decimal over appropriately and then multiplying by 10 and some integer uh, value. So if we take the 300 and move the decimal over two places to the left, then we end up with 3.00 times 10 to the second, because that's basically saying, yeah, we're going to times it by 100, right? And that gets us to the 300. Now, by writing it out, this 3.00 times 10 to the second, now that both of these zeros, because they're to the right of a decimal place, they're going to act as significant figures. This 3.00 times 10 to the second is going to be three significant figures. So we are going to use scientific notation to our advantage whenever we're communicating out numbers, especially big numbers, where we want to say, yeah, these zeros are significant, um, but just writing them like we did at the very top, just 300, it kind of makes it ambiguous. Now, sometimes what you're going to see uh, is this example here at the very bottom where you're going to say 300 and there's going to be a decimal behind it. And some textbooks say, well, you know, this is a great way of denoting to the reader that the, both of those zeros there are significant. So 300 with a decimal behind it is sig figs. You know, that, that means three sig figs. I'm not going to accept uh, on tests, homeworks, otherwise, you writing out this 300 like this. I want you to use your scientific notation. Uh, if you run into a situation where you need to present 300 as having three significant figures. Um, I only reason I'm bringing up this 300 with this decimal right now is because you might see it in uh, your journeys in chemical or uh, biological uh, lands.